it based on chemistry? Is everybody ready for chemistry class? Is there a test? There is always a test. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Tom Sawyer. I'm actually a chemistry physicist, so I love you. His name's Tom Sawyer. I love it. You should all get excited. His name? Yeah. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go over all three devices. Right? So you guys are getting the Gemini. The Gemini is a combination of both of these devices, right? Okay. So as we go over it, we'll talk about the subtle differences. Now, the biggest thing that we'll kind of pay attention to are some of the capabilities and the limitations, because when you talk about the two technologies, Ron versus the FT technology, they see different things, they see it in a different manner. An easy way to describe it is if we're going to do biometrics on everybody in the room, let's say this half of the room I do a retinal scan, and this half I do a fingerprint. I'm doing the same basic thing ultimately to identify a person, but the technology and the way I go about doing it is different. So because of that, there is a little bit of a difference in the capabilities. There are things that some, one of the devices see that the other doesn't do much first. So you want to keep that in mind. The other thing to kind of keep in mind is if you ever get a no match on a device, I want you to go look at the spectrum. And I'll show you how you can see the spectrum and so forth. And the reason I want you to look at the spectrum, I want you to look at it to make a determination. Did it just not hit it because it didn't see it correctly, properly or something? In other words, is there data that should be able to see it? Or is it something that's really not amenable to the technology? Does that make sense? So when you look at it, for example, the very first, the easiest, the biggest one, the RMX uses Raman technology. It cannot see water. Okay? FTX using FTIR technology sees water. So when you go down range, if you had a water-based material and it was 90-some percent water or whatever, this thing may very well come back and say, man, I don't see anything because it doesn't see water. Water kind of blinds it almost. This will see water. Now, let's say it's hydrogen peroxide in water. This will see the water, and if the concentration of the peroxide is up, it's, it's fairly high, if it's a 6% or something like that, it may see both of them. But if it's low, it's 2% or 3%, it may only see the water. This will never see the water, so it will only see the hydrogen peroxide. Okay. And the reason I point that out, a lot of times people will go down range with a device and they'll get a read. The FT said it's, it, it said water, the Raman says it's hydrogen peroxide, and people will stop and say, well, which is it? It's both. Okay. In that as well, when you get a result, the screens will be colored. There'll be green, blue, red, or yellow screens that will come up. And those screens are going to dictate kind of that confidence, if you will, as far as did it hit it, did it not hit it. Green and blues are good, yellows and reds are kind of like, oh, okay, let me do something else. Okay. So we'll talk about it, we'll look at it, we'll kind of go through it. So, your class safety first. If you do bring out um, chemicals, um, I do recommend and encourage you to wear gloves. I draw gloves just because I don't want to get chemicals on your hands and doing some other weird different thing or something like that. So ask questions, go to training, ask questions of me, I don't care. Yell, holler, throw, spit, do something to get my attention. As a side note, I, work, I live in Kansas City. I, um, I'm the chemist for the Kansas City Fire Department's hazmat team and the uh, police department's bomb squad. So I do, I've been doing emergency response for it. After they let me out of the lab, finally I'm like, when your friends are monkeys and rats and stuff, like, you need to get a light to do that deal. So, now it's firefighters and cops. <laughs> no, <I don't> <laughs> it's all good. So we'll talk about some real basic chemistry. And I do mean real basic chemistry. Just because both technologies need one thing in order to get a hit. And if they don't have that kind of chemical, uh, chemical, they can't see the chemical. And that one thing is a covalent bond. So if we go back to basic chemistry. If something is purely ionic, table salt. Neither device can see it. But again, that's good information. Because if you go down range, let's say it's a white powder call, and you're like, the Raman side didn't see it, the FT side didn't see it, we just took that whole field of possibilities and went, okay? But use all of your other stuff. Use your papers, use water solubility, if that were the case, water reactivity testing, and so forth, M8, M9, use. 
if you use F paper, oxidizer paper, or whatever it is you're using. So use all of that. So I'll talk about some of the basic operation. We'll have a chance to play with it. So we'll, I brought some products. We'll play with it as we're going through the evolution on the slide deck and so forth. And then really at the end, my big thing is I want you to be comfortable taking samples, getting hits, and getting reads. When you pay attention to the technology, we go through how the device is being used and so forth. Just understand that. The biggest thing I also will tell you right now with the device is when you get ready to use one of them and you get ready to run a sample, be patient. And what I mean by that is read the screen. All three devices will give you prompts on the screen, kind of giving you an indication of what you're about to do or what you're supposed to do. Okay. Raman shoots a laser, we can kind of go a lot of people love it, they fall in love, and they're like, man, I can go fast, I can go sample, sample, sample. Then I go to FT, and it's like, oh, I slow down. And in FT, you've got a little diamond. Same with on the Gemini, you've got a little diamond. You have to clean the diamond, you have to run a background, you have to run a sample. It's always a three-step process when you're doing that. Okay? Raman's a little bit differently, and we'll kind of run through all that. So, we'll talk about how it works, some basic safety issues and concerns for it, the devices, and so forth. And then this will be the bulk of what we're going to do is actually performing scans. Right? At the end, I'll talk a little bit about instrument, in, uh, instrument maintenance and whatnot and some of the other support procedures. Chemistry, like I said, as it relates to that response, understanding the needs of both and bonds. But the big one is going to be how the device works and then interpreting results. Okay? All of the devices have little menus on them where you can access things like the NIOSH pocket guide or built into the devices. Use things like trade names and synonyms. Okay? Most hazmat teams, most firefighters, I don't know. I really don't know if you guys have any advanced chemistry training, but what freaks out a lot of people I see across the country or everywhere they go down range and all of a sudden they get this chemical. It's like, oh my gosh, it says diethylmethyl benzamide. And they're like, what is it? Well, if we said it was gasoline, we'd all go like, okay, it's gasoline, because we can understand the hazard. But when we hear that other one, we're like, uh, we seize up. If I told you that's the chemical name for DEET or mosquito repellent, all of a sudden we're like, okay, it makes sense. So go back, use trade names, use synonyms, use the other information and so forth. Google's your friend out there on a hazmat call anymore. You know, something comes up and you're like, what the heck is this with your chemical or whatnot? What's its uses? How does it apply? Things along those lines. Like I said, we'll integrate sampling and monitoring and all that type of stuff. So, like I said at the very beginning, Use everything else. The devices are not technically intrinsically safe. Use LEL monitors. Don't go into an unexploded paper file or whatever. Use your LELs, your PIDs. If you have FIDs, utilize those devices as well. Just find a niche for the device, and the niche on this is solid and liquid sampling. Okay, so when I go down range, I'm asking that question. So I'm going to start with my atmospheric monitoring stuff as well, right? So we're really what I want to impress upon that is use all those other things. Use your electrochemical sensors and stuff. Use whatever devices that you have. Okay? If you have, uh, like you, I don't know, if you have a JCAT or an LCD or anything like that for WMD type stuff, and mobility, given that a blank stare and you're like, nope, I don't know what that device is. So, okay, we'll it. Whatever works for you, whatever device you have, or whatever, just find it. Remember, this is for solid and liquid sample. Complement it and continue to do other things as well with it, document, verify all those different things. Okay? So, again, two different technologies Raman and FTIR, or 4A Transform Infrared. Raman is what the RMX is going to shoot. It has a probe, this little probe actually wraps around and so forth, and we utilize this probe. Okay? It's going to operate via a laser. It's going to shoot a laser into the chemical. It's going to excite the chemical. It's going to cause chemical movement, if you will, and it's going to measure that movement, those bonds. FT is a diamond. Technically, this is known as a diamond ATR, which is a thing we reflect into. You have to remember that, but if somebody ever says diamond ATR, that's what they're talking about. It takes all light, white light, and it basically shoots it, think of like a prism or something like that, and it measures the absorption. So well, that one measures the scattering, this one measures the absorption. And it goes back to my analogy of you know, the retinal scan versus the fingerprint. Okay? They're trying to do the same thing as far as identification, but there's two different ways in which they utilize that, you know, the information and so forth. The other reason that's important, remember I 
difference that one sees things, the other doesn't see. When you look at the spectrum, the spectrums may look initially the same. When people first look at it, they're like, oh, it's a spectrum, it looks the same. But you can't really take a Raman spectrum and an FT and overlay it, because if you look at the bottom, when you see the spectrums, you'll see wave numbers, and the wave numbers are reversed. The Raman will go low, it'll go 500, below 500 up to about 2800, but the Raman, I mean the FT rather, will start at 4000 and go down to 1000, so they're reversed. Okay? So again, it's just that you can't overlay them, there are different technologies, keep that in mind. They both work, they both do a tremendous job of what they're designed to do, but they each have a limitation, so we have to understand that limitation. They're not competing. So not designed for gases, vapors, not designed for biological rad and so forth. You notice here I say it's not designed for trace level detection. So if I took something and I took a product and I put one little drop of a product and I had like half of a percent, a tenth of a percent, it's not going to find that trace level. It's designed as a chemical identification device, so it's finding materials inside, but it has to have enough product to see it. Okay. So typically I need two, three, five percent type of thing, concentration. It will do mixtures, all devices will do mixtures. The limitation on that is about four typically, maybe five occasionally. Okay. But when you run, one of the things from a sampling standpoint, if I ask you, how many chemicals are in here? How many different chemicals do we know? No, not really. Now, if I took another sample, if I took this one, <coughs> and I pulled that, you can clearly see there's an orange and kind of a white or yellow one. There has to be a minimum of two, and I would know that by visual inspection. When you run samples, do not be afraid to run a, a scan or a sample when you take something and run that same sample two or three times because you're running the composite. Okay. It's kind of like taking a street drug or street narcotics. And I'm assuming you're like every other city across the country and you have no opioid or no narcotic problems in the Salt Lake area. Okay. Not whatsoever. But when you do sampling on street products when things are just out, they're not always uniform, are they? So I have to be cognizant of taking multiple collection from multiple points when I run the sample in order to get an actual hit. Okay? So keep that in mind when you run a sample here. Just because the instrument says one thing doesn't mean it's only one thing. If I shoot right up through here, if I try to take a sample and I only get the orange crystals, and my device says, hey, you have chemical A, and I stop, I'm like, okay, I found chemical A. But I know on visual inspection there's more than just chemical A in that mix. Okay, so keep that in mind, even if it's something like that, in that class of white powder, run it the second or third time, run it from a different point, collect different samples and so forth. So that's how we want to kind of run that device. Oops, we can get hit that way and so forth. Okay? So like I said, spectroscopy. Raman is energy scatter, this is absorption. You can't see it real well, but when you look at things, the spectrums are actually going to be different. Okay, so you can't overlay one. Now, some chemicals may bend within a specific region. You can look at it that way. Okay? Spectroscopy. Now, this is the exciting stuff. Everyone excited, right? Okay? All we're doing is we're shooting. On FT, we're shooting white light. If you enter through a prism, you notice you get a color spectrum, right? That's what FT is doing. That's what your FTX and the FTIR component of your Raman are doing. They're shooting it through a diamond. They're creating a prism. And they're going to measure what colors, what wavelengths, were absorbed because all colors represent wavelengths. That's all they're simply doing on it. FT and Raman sit in that infrared range. Okay. I don't care about that. And it's measuring the movement. All chemicals, all covalent bonds have different movements. And that's really what it's trying to measure. Okay. I think that's exciting, isn't it? Incredibly. <laughs> like, oh my god, this guy's an idiot, right? <laughs> That's all right, my wife and kids can all say that, okay? All right, what's the fundamental difference? An ionic bond, a metal and a non-metal, it's like a magnet. Can you see the forces of a magnet that hold materials together? Nope. Covalent bonds are more like strings or springs. 
They're attached, they're sharing. I can see that. Why is that important? Your periodic table. So if you go back to basic chemistry, things in one and two, if they combine with elements in class seven or 17, whichever table you want to look at, the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetate, if you combine them with those products, one and seven, two and seven, you're going to make a purely ionic compound. So guess what? None of your devices will see it, and your, all your devices will say, no match. Okay? We'll do a sample. Well, let's talk about acid for a moment. You're going to go out in a spill, and you measure it, and it has a pH of 1. It's an acid. Now, you can do different things, and I'm not here to tell you how to run you know, all your other stuff and, and everything. If you have an FID, run an FID. Hey, it's an organic acid, inorganic. You can do whatever. Okay? But <clears throat> hydrogen is in group 1, right? Where's chlorine? Right there. Is that a 1 and a 7? Yep, that's a group 1 or a group 17. Is that a group 1 and a group 17? Yes. Will the devices see it? No. What's the only component of hydrochloric acid that the devices will see? Water. Now, let's do nitric acid, which is hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. I've got hydrogen in group 1, but I've got nitrogen in group 15 and oxygen in group 16. Should it be able to see nitric acid? The answer is yes. Why? Because the nitrogen and the oxygen form the covalent complex. So all of a sudden the device says, I can see nitric acid, but I can't see hydrochloric acid. Okay? By the same token, sodium and chlorine, like I said, table salt, can't see it. Okay? Potassium chloride, can't see it. I can't see sodium chloride table salt. Can I see sodium chlorate, which is sodium, chlorine, and oxygen? Where's oxygen? Is oxygen in 1, 2, and 17? No, it falls outside. Guess what? Chlorate is chlorine and oxygen combination. I now have my covalent bond. My device now sees it. Okay. So when you go down range, it's some of the things that we need to kind of make an assessment. What are we doing? You know, what type of situation do we have? What type of intel are we getting and whatnot? But if all the devices are coming back, nothing, 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 nothing. You either have a completely unresolvable mix type of thing, or you've got something very basic, and I'm not counting on. So go back to physical state. I'm on a white powder ball, nothing, nothing, nothing. And I know people don't want to hear that because they want the devices to go, hey, I want you to light up and show me everything. And I can bring you samples, and we could, and I could show you a dozen samples and say, oh, look, it gets a hit on the FD and it gets a hit on the ROM. But I'm going to give you a couple samples that one sees and one doesn't and so forth so that we understand that aspect of it. Okay? That's it. That's kind of the basic chemistry. See, that wasn't too rough, was it? Right? So, where does it fit in your toolbox? So, my question to you is that that's going to be your challenge: is how you will implement it into a response strategy. Again, go back kind of over your criteria. For my guys that I work with and that I teach and so forth, we kind of have a five-tier yeah, you know, initial sampling. Is it radioactive, is it flammable, toxic, reactive, or corrosive and reactive? That's kind of that five-tier approach and so forth. But again, we're dealing with solids and liquids, so we find that. We start with the atmosphere of your monitoring devices. Um, if you're using a multi-ray, use your multi-rays with your LELs and PIDs. If you're using a DRA or XAM or whatever, an RKI or whatever device you're using. Measure that, measure your flammables and your toxic and stuff, make entry until we can get into that sampling strategy and so forth. Okay? So combine it. Combine it with your gas, your rad, your bio, and all your rubber stuff. This is one aspect or one component of your sample overall for a comprehensive sampling strategy. Okay? Alright. So the first offender of the Gemini, okay? And you've got devices, and you feel free to grab them, fondle them, caress them, we'll play with them, and so forth. The RMX has three basic functions. The RMX can be used in what's called a point-and-shoot mode. Since it runs a laser, a laser pointer goes like that, and it goes to a product, right? Can I get a laser through the glass? Sure, right? 
I can shoot the laser through the glass. So one of the huge advantages of ramen is that ramen will go through containers. But the question that most people have in the containers is, well, what will it go through? It needs to be able to see the product. In other words, I need to be able to see the product. So if I pick up that container, and I've got a, a chemical inside, I've got a clear vial, I have a green liquid. Should the ramen be able to get the laser into that liquid? Yes. I've got a dark container, and I see the liquid. Can you guys see a liquid level inside there? So if you can see a liquid level, the answer is, hey, we should be able to see it. Okay. Now, the one issue that ramen has is called fluorescence. Fluorescence is like driving down the road, and as I'm going up toward the stop sign, the light, whatever it happens to be, the sun is crest at the top of the hill, and the sun is blinding me. Right? Ever happened? The signs didn't go away. My ability to see them went away. Bright colored materials, dark colored materials, do that to the wrong. So keep that in mind. But when you're running it, you're going to get two signals that come up. One's going to say molecular, one's going to say fluorescence. Fluorescence is that optical phenomenon of that blinding of that light, if you will. So the first thing that I can do is I can do what's called point and shoot. And here's a little cone, and I'll find the cone. There's a little cone, and one will be in your kit that will go right on the top. You normally you want to use the cone, and I'll show you that in a little bit. The reason being is that when the cone is on, there's a focal point. It's like taking um, a magnifying glass or something out, and I want to go burn a leaf, right? And I take that magnifying glass, and we have to kind of adjust it, right, to get the correct focal point. The same thing will apply here. With the cone on, the focal point is six millimeters. With the cone on, what did you say it was? Six millimeters, one quarter of an inch, okay? Again, we'll play with it. Without the cone, it's 18 millimeters or three quarters of an inch. The premise behind that, the only time to use it without the cone is if you're going through a thick walled container. That's the only time you ever need to not use the cone. The cone will snap on, okay? So point and shoot, that's the first way we can use the um, RMX. We can do the same thing with the Gemini. The Gemini has its probe on the side. The Gemini has the cone built on, it's stuck onto it all the time. You can take the cone off, it's just that little cone. You have a spare cone in your case. Okay. The second way to use it, on the top of the device here, and on the top of the device here, you see a little polar insert. Okay. This is for vials. You have little four milliliter vials, which are... like that. You have a bunch of them that come with it. As a side note, if you go you, you, if you go to buy these, and this isn't on tape, you didn't hear me say that, if you go to buy these, do not buy them from Thermal. Go to VWR or go to the Fisher catalog or something. You can buy these for a gross of them for 30 bucks or whatever. If you go to Thermal, you'll get a little pack of 40 of them for $100. So if you need more, you can go to the catalog. That vial was right inside that little vial holder. There, we're in the Gemini. Okay. What does the vial holder do? It just takes away that movement, human movement. Now, what I have to do if I'm doing the vial mode is your ramen probe has to be inserted into the cradle. Here or here. Because the laser is always going through the probe. And if you notice, there's a little yellow band on the probe. When that gets inserted, if I put it like, let's see if I can get it. If I put it like that, where I can see the yellow band, the probe is not inserted fully, which means the focal point will not be correct. That band must disappear. and must kind of visibly go away. So you can pull that little probe out, so just keep that in mind. And the same thing will happen on the Gemini. When you rotate that around, it goes inside there, that little band kind of goes away. I pull it back a little bit and move it like this. Normally on the Gemini, if you pull it back, it just comes off. It goes like that, if I see the band, no bueno. Snap it into place, or lock it into place, and the device is good to go. You have the correct focal point. Okay. The RMX has a third function. I don't think you will ever use it, but the third function on your RMX is a Talon robot integration. This top part here, right there, that is for the military's Talon robots. Okay. You 
don't have that on the Gemini, you just have it on the RMX. So unless you have a Talon robot, that has no functionality for you whatsoever. Okay? So someone sees it, someone's like, hey, what's this little port? Can I use that? And you just say, no, can't use it. Okay? We don't have a robot, unless you can have a position of getting a robot. So that's your next purpose, try to get a robot. Robots are fine. Okay. Three basic ways to use it. Okay. You have about 12,500 chemicals or so forth in those ROM libraries. You've got another 12,000 or whatever, 13,000 in your FT libraries. In, in all combined, you have about 15,000 products. Okay. Because you do have some overlap. They're all uh, mil spec, mil 810G for durability, brightness, and so forth. So if you happen to drop it, if you're, if you're working with it and you're something like that, you drop it, put it on a table. <coughs> The only way you are really going to damage these, unless you truly dry, is don't do this. Don't take the probe, wrap the probe, and then walk holding and swinging the probe. These are fiber optics. You will eventually pull the fiber optics out. Okay? And I have seen guys do that. I've seen them take them and walk and they're swinging the device around and stuff. Don't do that. Right. What? It's okay. I've seen a lot worse. So mill spec again. One of the mill, the test, you drop it from a height of four foot on a concrete pad, three quarter inch concrete, 26 times. It keeps working. We've dug it in a one meter tank of water for 30 minutes. All the devices are totally waterproof. As long as the bottom is closed and sealed. You have a bottom here, this just rotates, and this thing just picks it back up. It's attached by a little lanyard. The Gemini have little the same thing, but they're on the sides. These don't come off. Just close them, seal them. So if you ever wanted to do decon, power down your device, seal up your unit. And that way you can really spray them or hose them and really thoroughly clean them that way or whatnot. Okay. Now if you want to turn them on and you want to get liquids into the electronics, then you can have a problem. But I would say don't do that. So when you get a result on the device, you're going to get actually four pieces of data. First thing you're going to get is the chemical name. You're also going to get a cast number, but you're then going to get a library. So the library is the category from which the chemical is derived. So where does that chemical exist? So is it in the International Task Force Most Hazardous Chemicals? Is it a CW agent? Is it an energetic or an explosive agent, a narcotic or so forth? So it will give you a hit. So if you were to get something and you were to have um, thiodide glycol, thiodide glycol, it would say that, and then it would say it's coming out of the CW agents. Okay. Like I said, and you'll be able to access more data and more information on the device as well. I'm going to show you how to do all that. So that is designed just to kind of give you some assistance because we know a lot of people don't have, or aren't chemists or don't have chemistry training. So it's that initial, all of a sudden we go down range and we get a hit or a result on something. And we just, where do we go from here? What is this telling me? What is this chemical? Because ultimately, my focus when I'm looking at response and I deal with you know our military groups and I'm overseas and doing that, it's hazard. Is this stuff hazardous? It's kind of like if I'm going to be working with one of the EOD groups overseas and they come across and we sample a chemical and they're like, hey, this chemical is explosive. So more data than we really want. Maybe how explosive, whatever. Or, you know, we can get into all that. But, hey, it's explosive. It's kind of like you go out to a hazmat call. I, my guess you don't distinguish between octane and gasoline spills, do you? <clears throat> Probably not out there. Chiefs out there saying, I want to know the octane rating, right? 87, mm -hmm. 91 octane. Yeah. We're focusing on hazards. All right, so what can the devices identify? So they can do explosives, classic organic compounds, things like petroleum products, pesticides, plastics, all that. Drugs, illegal illicit drugs and whatnot, chem weapons, quote unquote white powders. Substances in water, but not highly diluted. Again, I need that two, three, or five percent or better. They will do mineral acids, like I said, the sulfuric and the nitric acid. The key is even those mineral acids have full vanal bonds. Oxides, pigments, and stuff like that, sunscreens, food colors. It says here some ionic compounds. But what I mean by that, sulfate and phosphate. So sulfate, sulfur and oxygen, phosphorus and oxygen, ATE means oxygen. Where the device can get confused and still give me a hit. Okay? So let's look at something like ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate is the ammonium ion with a nitrate complex, nitrogen and oxygen. Okay? 
If I want to make an explosive, do I have to use ammonium nitrate or could I use, let's say, calcium nitrate? I can use calcium nitrate because the reason in, in ANFO, why do I use ammonium nitrate? I did as the oxidizing material. So let's use calcium nitrate. It, it is possible that when you go down range, the device could give you different results. And what I mean by different results, it could say, hey, I think this is ammonium nitrate, but I'm not sure if it's not calcium nitrate or potassium nitrate or strontium nitrate or magnesium nitrate, but I'm like, wait a minute, there's a similarity, there's a commonality here, and that commonality is it's a nitrate salt. It struggles with the ionic portion of that, ion, of that salt. So that's why it says it can use some ionic compound. Okay. Now, if you were to get that result, you would get the result, let's say it said calcium nitrate, sodium nitrate, magnesium nitrate, and so forth. It would come up in a green screen result and list the most amount. So a green screen, you'll see it again on the slide, that means two things. Positive match, one chemical. If you did vegetable oil, the device is going to come back and it's going to go cottonseed oil, safflower oil, corn oil. It's going to be like, hey, it's a vegetable oil. It's going to be highlighted in green. The device is saying, it's a vegetable oil. I may not be able to tell. That goes back to my gasoline analogy. It's gasoline. I don't know the octane. I know it's gasoline. Okay. That makes sense. But when we look at it that way, we understand that. Okay. What can it not identify? The Raman, the RMX and the Raman portion of the Gemini cannot do dark colored materials. Part of the reason goes to safety, but part of the reason, the main reason is that fluorescence. FT does not have a color issue. Only the Raman. So only the ones with the probes have the color issue. Okay? So the darker material. Now, I think about it also from a safety standpoint. If I take my little vial, and I'm going to fill this all the way to the top and put a cap on it, and I'm going to have, let's say, a <coughs> black thing powder inside there and I subject that to heat, which is a form of energy, what's likely to happen to that vial? It's going to go pop, right? Okay. Remember, your laser is a form of energy, and we're giving that energy to that vial or to that sample. So one of the things from a safety standpoint that we want to consider is minimizing sample sizes. So darker colored materials, we would avoid starting with the ROM, and if we can start with the FT, we would go that route. If we have to go to the ramen, and we can do simple safety things. First of which would be, don't put it in a vial and cap the vial, uncap it. Don't allow it to build pressure. Second thing, when these go into those vial holders and you're shooting it, how much product do I have in there compared to the space of the vial? Okay? That's enough product to get sample. Because when the laser goes in, the laser hits it down here, right at the very bottom. So I don't have to fill these things very all the way up. Okay? So kind of keep that in mind when we run samples and stuff. So can't do dark materials, highly for the rest of the materials. So things like dyes and stuff would be struggle. Again, this is for just the wrong inside of it. It won't do pure metals. And you can see here, there's my hydrochloric and hydrochloric. Okay. But so we go down range, pH is one or zero or whatever. We run the Raman on it, we run the FT on it, we get no match, no match. We're pretty sure that it's one of the ionic mineral. You can either stop, you know, if it were me, what I would do is I would probably run things like F paper and maybe a copper wire test or something. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Do you have F paper? Okay. Run F paper and rule out the HF. You know, copper wire, have you ever done a copper wire test? Copper wire test is if you take copper wire, They'll make like a little nest or roll around something. You can put a drop or two of a liquid sample on it and burn it with propane. If it's got a halogen in it, the fluorine, the chlorine, and all that, it'll actually change the color of the flame to green. It'll be a very fluorescent green color. So it's a good indicator of the presence of a halogen if you don't have another way to get a halogen. And if you had, you would with some type of a halide, you know, to your sensor or something that way. Not designed for bios, rads, and again, highly diluted materials, things along those lines. Okay. All right, so there's your device. Ready? Catch. It's on the end, I don't know how much. There you go. You guys ready for the device? Catch. That one's heavier. Actually, you should throw this one all the way in the back. <laughs> what are you drinking? The energy drink. Sorry. Let's 
isn't it? Yeah. There's probably all kinds of things. There's all kinds of things that are in there. Okay? This is your device. So, when you're running a device, whether you're running the RMX or your FTX, your screens are going to be the same. Okay? Your basic buttons. The buttons on the RMX and the FTX are identical except for this button here. And this button here on the RMX, this button is the button that's used to turn on or activate the laser. On the FTX, you don't have a laser, so that button is replaced with a flip screen button. Okay, just so you can rotate the screen 180 up and down. Okay. <clears throat> File holder on the RMX, and on the, on the Gemini you will see it as well. On the RMX, you have this is your laser indicator to tell you when the laser is on. On the Gemini, did you get your break already? Give it to you 30 seconds. I know. This will illuminate. The little hazard symbol will illuminate when the laser is on. Okay. All right. File compartment and all that type of stuff. Access to the device. <coughs> so your basic buttons at the bottom. And this applies to both the RMX and the FEX. This is an on-off and a wake sleep button. Okay. If the device, if your FTX is on but inoperable for about 15 minutes, it will go into a sleep mode. It will just look like it went, it looked like it turned off, but it actually went to sleep. Just press and release the button and comes back on. To power it all the way off, press and hold that button for two or three seconds, the device will actually say shutting down and then it'll go off. Then the next time you boot it up, it'll go through all of its diagnostics. Okay, as it starts back up. If it's just asleep, you can press and release it and it comes back up. Okay. This is your enter or your select key. So if you ever want to execute a function, so right now the word scan is highlighted. So if I wanted to execute that function, I could press the enter key. I have a scroll key so I can move up and down within my windows. Okay? Up and down. Other windows will come up and allow me to move left and right. The button with the X is your stop or escape key. So if you get to a screen or a window and you don't like what's going on and you want to do something different, press the X button. And the Gemini have those buttons as well. So the enter key is just like that, the escape key, the scroll buttons, okay? The function is a little lab. The primary fundamental difference, other than the Gemini has both technologies in one and those are separate, the Gemini does have a touch screen, these are not touch screens. Okay, so the RMX and the FTX are not touch screens. The Gemini can be operated in touch screen mode. Okay. Um, I will tell you, when you're downrange and you're wearing gloves, you are not going to be able to use the touch screen now. Okay. It's kind of like trying, it'd be like trying to use, you know, your iPhone or smartphone or whatever when you've got gloves on or like that. Use the buttons. That's the reason the buttons are large. We know people are wearing gloves and stuff while they're doing it. Okay. This is called your scan key. So the scan key is what allows me to actually go take a scan when I'm doing my chemical sample. Okay. All right. On the FTX, that's replaced with just what looks like a square type button. It's a flip screen. Okay. Power down. Yeah, power up. Oh. Power down. You want to power down? My battery did. That's my scan. Batteries for the RMX and the FTX are interchangeable. The batteries even say this side up. Battery door opens, slide the compartment over. TSA is stealing more batteries from me. But I don't care if you carry the device with you. But you can't have, well, I can carry the spare one in my pocket or whatever, but I can't keep the, device, the battery in the device where it belongs. So, on the RMX and the FTX, the batteries are identical and they're interchangeable. On the Gemini, the battery is internal and you cannot access it. Okay. Now, if you go downrange, let's say you get a call tomorrow or whatever. We're going downrange and none of our batteries work in your kit or your case. 
you have Surefire 123A batteries. It takes three batteries, they go in on the bottom of the FDX and the um, RMX, they go in on the side of the Gemini. On these, they go in just to get in series, one after another, they're the one on top of each other. These things will run a good 10 or 12 hours or whatever. Not rechargeable, but you can run it if you get gotten into that pinch. Okay. And then once you run it, 10 or 12 hours, replace it. Yeah, then we have to replace it. But that 123A is basically what most flashlights, like the heavy duty flashlights, they take those. So the RMX and the FDX, you have two of those lithium ion batteries. One in the device, one in your case. You have a standalone battery charger, they charge up that way. You can charge the batteries in the device though. You can do it that way. The only thing the device doesn't do if you charge the battery that way is it doesn't like try to discharge and condition it. But you can plug it in right at the bottom and so forth. Okay. On the RMX, you will have that little laser or that little key button. That key button is what we would use to unlock the laser and turn it on. It's an ANSI standard that prohibits us from allowing the laser to be on unless you go to a secondary type of system. Your screen for your RMX and FDX, scan and view library and tools. That's your basic screen. I'm going to take a scan, I want to review my data, I want to see what chemicals are in the library, and if I need to do any adjustments, things like date and time and all that type of stuff. The one thing that you're going to want to use in the tools menu is called the cell test. Here's the good news about the devices. They're all self or auto calibrating devices. You do not have to calibrate these instruments. So you don't have to, you know, again, use multi rays. Yeah. You know, go do your monthly check, or whatever. You don't have to pull these out monthly and say, oh, run through its calibration. A self test, though, is the validation tool that documents and it will do it on the device that it's working correctly. Okay? And the reason we put the primary reason we put that on there is for legal issues, really. Because when we first started using them in court, and they were used in court, the Department of Justice wanted the validation. They said, hey, you didn't calibrate this. How do you know it's working right? It's a known reference standard and it worked. Okay. All right. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. In your case, you'll have your uh, chargers, you'll have extra vials, you'll have your little nose cone. Uh, things like that are all going to be in the case. You have a little card reader, SD card, spare batteries. A little memory card. The only thing you need to do with the memory card is to transfer data. Do not leave the memory card in the devices. It's only to transfer data. Okay. It's an interactive class. Think of it that way. Okay. So keep that in mind. The only time we need the memory card is to transfer data. So if you go out to a call and it has information that you want and you want to attach to a runner board or something, you would transfer the data back off. Okay. Underneath it, that's where you get your battery charger and your spare battery, your sure fire battery, and so forth. The nose cone has a shield that goes with it. The shield can slide off. The shield is just a reminder that you're dealing with a laser. So you've heard the, the old cliche, never point a laser pointer in your eye, right? Okay. Do not point the wrong probe or the laser from the probe in your eye. Okay. Laser pointer. What happens if I hold the laser pointer in my eye for a period of time? Or what potentially could happen? It could cause some type of damage, right? That is shooting about one, maybe one and a half milliwatts. The probe is shooting 250 milliwatts. That is significantly stronger than this. Okay. That's also why we don't want to scan dark. Okay. We have a dry erase marker. Ah, black. I'll show you why we don't need darks later. Black markers work really well. You can use it as a fun training tool later on. Okay? So, power up the instrument. Both buttons are the same. Okay? Go to sleep. Both buttons are the same in the RMX and the FDX. Hold it down, it goes to sleep. Okay? Um, on battery power, the RMX, if it's idle for five minutes, the RMX, when the FTX comes up, these two buttons on the top will be illuminated when it comes on. They will not be on the RMX. The RMX will only illuminate these two buttons after I press this button and I enter the access code to activate the laser. 
The only other difference then is the RMX will no longer go into a shutdown or a sweep mode if you've activated the laser because the device is saying, if you've activated me, I'm ready to go, we're on a scan. So if you just put it on the left and on the rig and that was coded that way, then it would just go all the way until the power itself down to the back of that. So opening the bottom panel, just slightly rotate them counterclockwise, you can rotate them. There's only three things you can do in the bottom. Slide the compartment over to the right, the door will drop down and you can replace the battery or insert the Surefire batteries. This is your memory card reader, so if you have data you want to get off the device, we take data off the device. Okay? Let's just say you have all the current softwares now, but let's just say six months from now we decided we were going to do a software update. The way it would work is we would send you an email. You get that email with one page instructions on how to update it and you do the memory card. You just download it to your desktop, it writes to the memory card, insert the card, and it goes through the updates automatically. Then it's literally a matter of watching the screen on the devices themselves. Okay? But that would all be on that data sheet that would come with it. Okay? There's where you plug in for your AC power. You notice the middle one has the X through it. It kind of looks like a weird little adapter or whatever. Okay? It has no functionality for you. So there's only three things you can do on the bottom. Switch batteries, use your memory card, or plug in for power. Okay? Like I said, the batteries are the same for the RMX and the FTX. They're labeled this side up. As long as that's up, arrow going in, you have the proper orientation for it. You've got a standalone battery charger with the condition and charge the battery up that way. But like I said, you can power, you can charge the battery or you can use it plugged in. Okay? You can't see it very well if you drop those um, the doors that go to the battery compartment, you may be able to. It does have polarity symbols on the bottom of the door opens up uh, just for orientation. They're also on the Gemini for its orientation. So, like I said, scroll keys, your select or enter key to activate something, your escape key. Okay? And then the top right one is your scan key. That's how we're going to take a scan, how we're going to take a sample. Now on the FTX, where you've got the diamond up there, you've also got this anvil. This is manually operated. The Gemini will automatically up and down the handle after you swing it into place and stuff, but then it will automatically up and, you know, motorize, okay? On the FTX, you've got a sampling. You've got this knob. So what you do here is up like this, you rotate it up, and then you use the knob to rotate or manually lower the handle onto the diamond tip. You will lower it, and you will hear it click. Once you hear it click one or two times, stop. You, if you clicked it 10 times or 12 times, you're not going to build any more pressure. It's kind of like a, a torquing wrench, you know, or a screwdriver. Click, click, it's like, okay, I got my torque pressure. It's the same basic thing, okay? That's going to build this pressure. Okay? The question that a lot of times people will ask is, is why do I need pressure? Remember I said on the ROM, when I'm using the ROM, I have that little mini focal point. It's a quarter of an inch off, right? On the diamond that goes on the Gemini and on the FTX, that essentially, if you want to call it a focal point, is essentially two or three micrometers or microns. So I have to crush solids. I don't have to crush liquids, just solids. Because I want to get them perfectly flat onto that diamond. Okay? Now with that, also reminds me that when I crush something on there that's a sample, I have to clean the bottom of that anvil as well. So not only will I clean the diamond, I'll have to clean the bottom of the anvil. So when you get ready to run a scan, and this will actually, uh, the scan is the same for the um, RM and the FT. But on the FT, when you get ready to run it, you're going to get that reddish or orange colored background. It's going to say, stop. I have to do a couple of things. I have to clean the diamond off. So did you clean it? And in your kit, you should have alcohol wipes. And I've got more with me. So you take an alcohol wipe and you clean the diamond off. Give it a couple of seconds to make sure the alcohol evaporates. Run it background. Because an FT, it seats everything. Even atmospheric carbon dioxide and stuff could interfere with the reading. Okay? Atmospheric O2, water, all that could interfere with the reading. So I have to clean the diamond, I have to then run the background. So this is going to tell you stop. Do not apply the sample yet. It says clean the sample and the tip. Okay? So I'm going to do that. On the bottom, you notice it says session go cancel. And then go is highlighted. I'm ready. It's already done it. Let's go. Let's do it. Session is a file folder system, essentially. 
Session is how you store or where you store data. <clears throat> so, technically, I'm not supposed to tell you how to do that. I tell you what I do. And what I do is a session to me is an instant number, an address, or something like that. So if I'm going out with Hazmat 71 in Kansas City and I'm kind of like, hey, we're going to 333 West Pershing, that's the federal postal facility the, uh, with the IRS, they're all combined with them. I said, we go in there, we have a file folder that says 333 West Pershing because we go there all the time. But if I'm going to 123 Main Street, I can either name it that or I can call dispatch and say, what's my incident number and I can name it that way. And all that's done with this session. So if you just use, if you're at that screen, you can use the left arrow, I have a session, press enter, you'll get a menu. And it'll give you all the sessions you have, and the very top of the state, create a new session. So again, somewhat intuitive and so forth. Or you can cancel back out. So you can cancel by using the right arrow in the enter, or just hitting the X button. Once your background is done and you press the go, it'll do the background, and then you'll get a green screen. That's when it will tell you to apply your sample. So, reviewing data, if you go to review, all of your data, every scan you take is going to have a date and time stamp. Okay? And it'll always bring up the most recent one first. So here it says session one, session two, and the little bullet is telling me that's the current or active session. Okay? So all of my data is going to be inside there. So you can see some have green, that one has a blue screen. So green screen actually means positive match one chemical, blue screen means positive match mixture. Okay. You'll see that more as you run some scans and whatnot. The Gemini components. Oops. The Gemini components, you have your basic keypad that goes right there in the middle. You have your touch screen display. Okay. The little diamond, that is your sampling surface right there on the little diamond. There's your little motorized handle. Your bio compartment goes right there. The round and probe sits on the side. You have a laser indicator that will go here on the side and it will go right there with the laser hazard warning so that will illuminate when the laser is actually active. Okay? Pull back the little rubber uh, compartment cover and you'll see the SD card slot will go inside there. So that's where you will get into things like you can power it up, you can put in your batteries and all that on your Gemini and just go right on the side instead. So again, from a laser, from a spectroscopy standpoint, the Gemini, the infrared, and the Gemini, the FTX, or the, the infrared, and the laser does the Raman. So, Raman shoots a single wavelength of light. It measures that energy or that scatter. FT shoots all wavelengths and it measures absorption. It helps to go back and think of retinal scan versus fingerprint or whatever works for you. So you can do it Again, light hits it, it measures it, oops, and it comes up with a signal. That signal is that fingerprint of the movement of those chemical bonds. That's all it is. Okay. The diverging laser. So this is a colloid or a beam laser. So you can shoot, see it shoots a beam wherever it goes. It doesn't matter. The laser on the Raman goes to a focal point and then away. Okay. So I can't scan a container from foot away. I can't scan a container from across the room. I have to take the probe and I want the probe to the exterior of the container to make sure that the focal point is inside the container. So again, we're going to come up with a fingerprint. So this is, that is actually a Raman spectrum for toluene. Okay. I don't expect you to get into spectral analysis per se, but what we want to look for, if you ever get a no match, see if I have peaks. If I have vertical peaks, I have data. If I have valleys or negative peaks, I either have invalid data, I did my background wrong, something interfered with the scan. If I got something and it was just kind of more of that flat line, then I would be like, no, that's not good anyway. I didn't have bad, but I didn't have any good. Okay? So what the device does is it takes your scan and then it goes into the library and begins to compare it. It says, yeah, I match it. It's just that algorithm that's inside. It says, yeah, I'm going to match it. Okay? Focal point, okay? Quarter of an inch, six millimeters. With the cone, 18 millimeters without the cone, okay? 
Use it with the cone all the time, except if that wall of that container is so thick that you can't get it through. Then that's when I, that's the only time I would switch it. Okay? The biggest thing though that you want to remember is that focal point has to go inside. So if I'm sampling a bottle like this with a ramen probe, take the probe and touch it right to the outside of that bottle. Okay? And when you run a scan, again, you're going to see signal that comes up on the display. And that signal is telling you, is the device seeing something? Okay? The more signal, the more it sees, the faster it will be able to identify the material. These are the result screens that you can get. Okay? That look a little different on our Gemini. You'll see that in a minute. So there's five <coughs> possible results, or four possible results in five colored screens. So remember, green screen means positive, it means one chemical. So if I see this right here, if I got dextrose monohydrate, sweet low equal splenda. I'm, I just went out on a white powder call and I came up with that. How do I interpret that? It's an artificial base sweetener. Now, if you want to go back and you want to say it's Splenda, you can say it, but it isn't technically, we don't know with 100% conviction that it is Splenda, but we do know it's the same basic chemical used to make Splenda. Okay? Because when you look at these, that's 97% dextrose monohydrate, that one's 98%, that one's 98.5%. It's just a little artificial other crap that they decided to do. Okay? Probably shouldn't say So green screen, one chemical, positive match. Blue screen, positive match, mixture. Here's the one thing that I want, the two things I want you to take away from this. Remember that it's a mixture that's identifying. So if I see this here, it says acetaminophen and aspirin. So that's how I would report it. But you notice over here it has these numbers, these percentage numbers. Ignore those numbers. Those numbers are in there for chemists, for us, for spectroscopists. They're not for responders. Those numbers are weighted percentages of spectral activity. Okay. We're going to go. We're going to run. Um, we're going to go to the Olympics. Hundred meter dash. Okay. What do you get if you come in fourth place? You get pat on the back. You're the first loser, right? Okay. It identifies in order of weighted percentages. But the weighted percentages has to do with the activity of the chemicals. So it's that race. It's how fast was it moving. Okay? So if I look at acetaminophen and aspirin, acetaminophen is doing this. It's going like that. But aspirin is going like this. That's the movement difference. That's why the acetaminophen has the higher number. Ignore it. When you report it, you just say it's a mixture of these two chemicals. So someone said, well, what's the concentration? I don't know. I don't really care. I just know it's a mix of those chemicals. Does that make sense? And then you're going to, and I know someone's going to do it because it happens all the time. It's going to be a month from now. You're going to go down range and you're going to go, hey, look at that. It's 71% of the minimum. And that's just, just showing me the identification. Okay. It's an internal battle of us to have it or not have it. Yellow screen means sick, right? So a yellow screen, in this case for methyl alcohol, is the device going, man, that sure looks like methyl alcohol. But the data wasn't, the match wasn't high enough quality for me to say with certainty that it's that chemical. But boy, it sure looks like it. And there are going to be times when you're going to get a yellow screen and you're going to look at the spectrum and you're going to make, crap, that's perfect. It looks great. Why didn't it give me a yellow screen? There are going to be times when you're going to look at it and say, it doesn't look anything like that. And it has to do with where the peaks fall and all that type of stuff, the distance between the peaks and whatnot. Okay. Right. Uh, can't, can't move those. Oh, yeah. So yellow screen is what we refer to as a similar right. Okay. As a side note, if the, the confidence or concentration goes into what are called rock scores or rock scores. It has to do with overall reliability, accuracy, false, and true positives, and all that type of stuff. We see a 97% rock, which is the same level of accuracy as MRIs and, and uh, CT scans. This fails a 97, exceeds a 94, which is um, the same type of accuracy level as a pregnancy test. 
in other words, if it says nothing, the, the device is looking and saying, boy, it sure looks like this. I would run the scan again. But then if you have, you have a drag or tube for alcohol, run a drag or tube for alcohol. Okay. Now, if you go look at it and we say it's methyl alcohol, I can <coughs> go grab my mold head. Okay. Should I get an LEL hit? Yeah, methyl alcohol. Should I get a PID hit? Okay. You're not in your head, so I'm going to pick on you. You did it earlier. <laughs> you did once. Okay. But then I can go back and look at what's put uh, under PID, what lamp you use, 10.6? That's it. So you look at that methyl alcohol that has an IP of 10.84. Are you going to see it on your lamp? No. But again, that's another example of how, hey, if this is truly methyl alcohol, my PID better not be going crazy, right? So I'm using a device really kind of outside of where it was designed, but I'm using its capabilities to help me with that. So I can go and I can get all that basic information. The red is the no match. Okay. So don't just shut down at the red screen or whatever. What you're going to do basically is you're just going to press the enter button two times. This is going to press the enter, it's going to say view spectrum, you're going to press the enter again, you're going to see the spectrum. That's where we're going to look for things like those peaks. Okay. On the Gemini, the screens look like that. Okay. So in this case, you would have a positive match for acetone. There's a cast number of the 704 in the library categories. A multiple positive. Baby oil, kerosene, power steering, mineral and anti There's some type of baby oil, mineral oil type of concoction. There's a mix. There's ethanol and water. Power steering fluid here is highlighted in yellow. So this is the device saying that it sure looks like power steering fluid, and that's our red screen. So again, on the RMX, FTX, the screens look like that. On the Gemini, they just look like that. The other, the other thing that's weird on the Gemini, if you want to call it that, is the, you'll have little buttons or little indicators here that'll say F or R. It's telling you which system you use. Did you use a Raman test on that? Did you do the FT test? Because you have to decide. Okay? Whereas on these, you've already decided by picking the device. Okay? Now, on the Gemini, I'm kind of jumping ahead. On the Gemini, if you get down range somewhere and you're like, I don't know which one to do first, there is a function, it's the lower right corner button on those eight buttons that says scan assist. It'll kind of walk you through a couple of questions. Is it dark, is it this, is it that? Right. So, no red, could be an item just not in the library, complex mix, something like that, unidentifiable. So what constitutes a good spectrum? Go by that, okay? So you can look here, this is a Raman spectrum, you notice the baseline is consistent. Okay? And I have my vertical peaks. That's what I want in a spectrum. And if I get that, I'm going to get a match. In this case, I would get a match for ethyl alcohol. Okay. But what happens when I start getting interferences? Like I said, biologicals can do it, light can do it, colored pigments can do it, and so forth. There's a Raman spectrum with a lot of interference. It looks like a ski slope. The algorithm may or may not identify the underlying peaks. Okay. If the ski slope were that bad, it's probably not going to do it. But if I am a Raman, see what looks like this big, huge ski slope? That's telling me interference, that's telling me fluorescence. But if I got a no match and I saw that ski slope, that's also the impetus to say it's probably a color issue. Go do the FT. I can try it again, I can try maneuvering and manipulating stuff and try running it but it's probably the FT function that's giving me the issue. What about that spectrum right there? Notice the zero drop a little bit, it's kind of fuzzy, but it comes up, it kind of flattens. So if I had a no match and I saw that spectrum, did it tell me that I really did anything wrong? No, it's just saying there's something weird going on here. Either reposition it, rerun it. If you run this on, that one is a, uh, an FT spectrum. If you ran it on that, I'd re-clean it. I may be trying it on the Raman or something that way as well. Okay? But if I got a no match here, all I want to look for is kind of is this relatively flat or smooth? I see some of this, so there's some noise, there's some interference. Maybe that's precluding the device from giving me a hit. But I do have data. So hopefully if I run that again, I'll be able to get a good hit. Okay? So that's really from a spectral thing. I don't expect you to go back and say, hey, yeah. 1,400 wavelength through whatever I have this specific type of you know, chemical bond in okay. With all three devices, if that crap happens to you and it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you go out somewhere and I 
man, you know what? I'm just not getting anything, and it's giving me good data. It's not giving me a hit. On the back of the devices is the 800 number. Call the 800 number and say, can you help with this? And we'll do what we'll it's reach back, and we'll walk you through that. So if you called me and it was 2 o'clock in the morning, if you, if you had my number and you said, hey, I need to do this right now, I would walk you through. Where are you? We'll get some information. Get your memory card, do this, do this, do this, and we'll walk you through how to email that spectrum to us. Our protocol is to give you a verbal confirmation within one hour from the time you receive the spectrum. Our average in 2019 has been 20, 21, 22 minutes. And then we follow it up the next business day with a written report signed off by a chemist or spectroscopist. Says this is what we saw, this is what we found. Okay. And in 10, 12, in 12 plus years of doing it, there has been, there was an occasion where someone sent me something and it's just kind of like, dude, I have no idea. And I, what do you mean you have no idea? I said, there's got to be 20, 30 plus different chemicals that are inside this little mix. And they're like, well, yeah, that's, they, people were blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, it looks like it's got A, B, and C maybe in it, but so if that's the case, that's the case. So what the track, so again, there's a good spectrum. This is a water spectrum. So water has this big, huge bend here around 3,300 and more of a sharper peak around 1,600 for water. Okay. As a side note, hydrogen peroxide moves right in here. So that's why if you had a low concentration of hydrogen peroxide, let's say it's 98% water, 2% hydrogen peroxide, you run it on your FT, you're probably going to get that. Your result's going to say, bingo, you've got water. Okay, but if you get it, if you suspect it based on intel, run your DNI paper, run your peroxide papers and stuff, and start running other stuff. Even if it comes back, if you ran this on an FT and it came back and said you have water and hydrogen peroxide, to me that's still one technology. I would want you to run other stuff. Okay? Run your oxidizer papers, your peroxides, run along or something like that. Just know that the ramen won't see the water. Okay? Alright. So what go? Oh, shoot. I screwed that slide up, didn't I? Here's what you have. You've got 12,000 plus items in your ramen, so we'll see things in water, not the water, and I can use it for pressure sensitive substances. So things, so you guys work with the, uh, the bomb squad. So if the bomb squad says, hey, we think this is TATP, pressure sensitive peroxide based explosive. Do I want to put it on the FT with the end Okay, it's all perspective, right? The thermal answer is no. Okay. Turn the cameras off, and my answer is kind of like, hey, let's go play. You know, type of thing. Okay. So, or something like that. Pardon? <laughs> Check, hey, you know what? That's a good thing. Check your warranties. <laughs> and the reason I say that, the reason I say part, have a dirt cheap letter ready. You know what's more surprising than that? I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, here's what, here's what you do. So, check your warranty. If your warranty is good for, let's say it's good for one year. I'm just going to say it's a warranty. You can get anywhere from a one to a five year warranty on your device. I don't know what you have. But let's say it's one year. At 11 months, call Thermo, and you've got your device, and you say, hey, my device won't do this. Okay? What will I do? And you make up some. It, it just, I can't ever get a good one. I can't get a good baseline. Okay, try that. And I go, okay, and you're cooking your arm or whatever. And I get, nope, didn't work. And eventually, the engineer that you're speaking with back in corporate in Boston is going to get frustrated and they're going to be like, it didn't work? No, it didn't work. It didn't work. When you send us your device, they will send you a loaner. Okay? When you get the loaner, you'll pack up your device and you'll send your device back in. They will basically tear apart and build it and re and everything for it. Never ever said So an FT better for thermally sensitive. Okay, so I have my black gunpowder, right? Do I want to do my black, uh, black gunpowder with my laser that's shooting all that energy at it? Probably not, so I can start on that side. Okay. Now I will tell you this, since Salt Lake, since you guys are splitting your devices, right? So like one group's gonna have the uh, ROM and one's gonna have the FT. So if you go out there with the dark you know, powders and stuff, man, I've got a dark power, but I don't have an FT immediately available. It's going to take me 15, 30 minutes to get the FT, and I want to do it. Do you do anything for um, like explosive testing now, like here in the test or pressure or anything like that? If you do, follow all that. If not, if you took it, so let's say you've got the black gunpowder grills, okay? 
and you put that aside somewhere, like a little one prill or two prills and stuff like that, if you hit it with the laser and it's in an open area, the laser is not going to blow up. The laser is going to basically looks like it just melted it and it just disappeared. Okay? But again, a lot of it's going to come back to common sense. But typically, if it's pressure sensitive, I'm going to go here because I don't have to physically touch it. If it's thermally sensitive or highly fluorescent, I go here. I'm not worried about the energy that I'm giving it, and I'm not worried about color. Okay? So that combination, you have and then the Gemini. In the Gemini, you just have to respond, or you just have to pick. But at the end, metals, simple ionics and stuff, and then back up. It's not going to work. But this kind of does both, because it has both devices in it. Okay? The only negative to that, really, is if you ever had a problem, and I did see somebody yank the fiber optics out of the um, the arm of the Gemini, and they're kind of like, well, my ramen is totally useless. And like, well, you have an FT, so until that can get repaired or whatever, you have one device. Okay. So it's kind of, you just have to kind of play up here. It's not necessarily this or that. Okay. Safety issues, give me a quick 10.30, give me a quick five minute little. All right, get up, little stretch, rotate, right away, right away, so you have to go to the It'll be good. Coffee filters, cardboard, and things like that can absorb energy. 
I can sample HMTD very safely with either device. It'd be better with the ramen because that will avoid the pressure sensitive. The other thing that you can do is when you're on your device and you turn your device on, remember it has the menus and one of which is library. If you go to the library and you find the chemical in the library, so if we were to find HMTD, guess what that tells me? That it has been tested on the device, it's in the library and it can be done safely. Okay? But we're going to use small amounts, we're going to use some safety considerations and things like that. The reason that we point out there with the coffee filters, they came from a military group that uh, called and said they had an HMTV using the Ron Meiser. They're like, really, how to do that? They filtered coffee, the, fil the paper was dry, it had hardened. The energy, as they shot through the bottom, the energy of the laser was absorbed by the cellulose fiber, which was then transferred back to the HMTV and caused that to happen. So avoid things like that, or avoid using it on the coffee filters. Use a white sheet of paper, like the copy paper. Yeah, you can sample on that and use a wash dish, things along those lines. But avoid things like the cardboards and stuff. Okay? <clears throat> For the ramen, when you get ready to run a ramen scan, you have some options. You have a scan delay option. A scan delay is a timer option. I can set 15 second increments up to two minutes. So in other words, if I thought, if I'm working with the EOD group and they said, hey, we think this is really uh, potentially explosive. Yeah, I use small amounts and everything. I can set a scan delay. Let's say 30 seconds. I'm getting ready to scan it, and I can just do that. Let's just back off a little bit. So we're not at risk. So we're not hovering over the top of it. You can set a timeout. A timeout is the maximum time that you will allow the laser to stay active. The default is five minutes. Okay? From a Raman scan, most scans will take 30 to 60 seconds. Even on the FT, it will be 30, that's the normal. If you start getting into that two minute range or three minute range, something is going on that's precluding it from seeing it really quickly. So it's either a complex mix, um, maybe it's just not amenable to it, the technology is not the library or whatever. Because there are things, you've got 14, 15,000 chemicals, yes, there are things that are not in the library. Okay. Um, so if you set it for two minutes and it takes 30 seconds, all the laser automatically shut down after you did. As soon as it finds it, it'll shut it down. Whether it takes five seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, as soon as it finds it. So really the advantage of that is if, uh, so you guys are getting these devices from the Chevron. Does Chevron have any chemicals? This is kind of a homework assignment. Does Chevron then have any chemicals that may be of interest to you that are not in the library? If that's the case, you will need to adjust the timeout because there's a way to add that chemical to the library and something you could do. Okay? Now, I wouldn't have anybody and everybody do it. I would have to kind of control it. And it's something that if you didn't want to do like immediately, you wanted to do it six months from now, you say, hey, Sharon just introduced this new chemical and I just checked my library and it's not on there. You can call the number and we will walk you through how to get it on. Okay? It's very simple, but you want to kind of control it because you're building the spectrum at that point. So you don't want to just, you don't want to go to the medicine cabinet and start throwing crap together and stuff. Um, if you do that, there are some caveats. The biggest one is you cannot name it something that already exists. Okay? We used to be, we used to allow you to name it whatever. And people would take sugar and they would call it something weird because they wanted it for a training evolution. But I go, I want it to be sugar, but I want it to come back and say fentanyl or whatever. Well, fentanyl's already in the library. Sugar's already in the library. So if you did that and you ran sugar, but you named it, hey, this is Tom's fentanyl, then it's going to come up. Remember that green screen, the multiple positive? It's going to say Tom's fentanyl and sugar. But it's going to be green, so it's going to be like, wait a minute, it's still one chemical. So the naming became an issue, so we took that function away. Okay. Um, the other one is you can lower the laser power. There's three power settings to the laser, high, medium, and low. The 250 is the high power setting. Medium is half of it, 125, low is about a quarter of it, right around 67. So again, if you got to that situation, you're like, mm, I don't know if I want to hit this, I'm going to set a delay, make sure, you know, the timeout, no more than five minutes or whatever. I'm going to lower that laser power down to low, I'm going to run it again. Don't leave it on low all the time, because what you're going to get is you're going to get scan errors that are going to say insufficient energy, increase the laser power, and run it again. Leave it on high unless you think you have a problem or that concern arises on the call. Okay? The other thing you can do is this, scotch tape. Don't use uh, uh, packing tape or masking tape. <coughs> use regular old-fashioned scotch tape. 
And if you're having a hard time, so let's say it's a white powder call and the powder's all over, I can't really get it collected very well. Take your scotch tape and tape it around and collect it on your tape. And you can shoot your ramen right there. Okay? You can take that tape and you can put it down on your FT and you can shoot. Now again, the chemical side will go down onto the diamond. So that's another way that you can go about using it. For a liquid, you don't need any more than about five, four or five drops. For the Gemini, you need two drops if you hold it on a 45 degree angle. It says leave the cap on. Liquids are not going to ignite inside the vial and so forth. Solids is the only time you would take the cap off. But for a solid, anything more than the size of a pea, I don't need it. That vial is shooting at the very bottom of it, so you just simply don't need that much problem. Okay? Solid materials, again, larger samples, I can do the scan delay. Um, I would take the vial off then for solids if you thought it was energetic or had a problem that way. But the key is sample size. So this is important. Size does matter. I have a shirt that I love to hold my lawn with, and it just says that on the back of the shirt, I have a picture of the device. Size does matter. My neighbor Mike gets mad at me because you know, I'm like, hey, Allie's 18, I have no other shirt, buddy. He's like, no, I don't know. It's all good. So minimize the sample size, safety features, blah, blah, blah. All right, the Gemini. Your Gemini has eight basic buttons. You kind of have a home screen. You select between FT and then move the ramen. You can go review all of your data and so forth. Like I said, you've got this, there's your review, your scan assist button is right there. It'll walk me through all my functions and ask me questions. We have a self-test function, which we're gonna do. We're gonna review it. You wanna get into tools, profile, on the Gemini, you can set, and I don't know if you want to do this or not, you can set profile settings, which will allow you to control who accesses the device. So anybody could have, you could change passwords and do all that. The only warning on this is if you set those passwords for individuals and things like that and set user levels, we can't correct that if something happens and someone gets locked out. Okay? So... That's something you have to consider before you go about doing that when you get into those profiles. And what I mean by profiles, you can basically say, hey, this person can do anything they want to do. This person can only take a scan, but they can't delete data. And you can do that, but everything then on those people are going to have their own individual passwords. Right, so you want to be careful or alert to that. The admin or the management button is where you can get into things like, hey, I have to adjust the date and the time, and I have to do things along those lines. Okay. Jump to the home screen up there, it's also going to be on your device. The laser light's going to be indicated, the profile, power, all that's going to be there. Okay. And we're going to create sessions. So what we're going to do is we're going to power our devices up, if they're not already up, and we're going to start with our self-test. Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? Is that Swings it around and puts it back. He did. It's in scripture. It's scripture. Unbelievable. <laughs> they are? You're not, not in the usually out. Yeah, I'm not in the industry that does that. Oh, yeah. So I was setting up the 
obviously, because you got it. Gina, how did you draw this short strip? Doyle, that's the name. So maybe yeah. see how yeah. it's illuminated in the yellow and yellow and yellow. But I think I'm going to say it because it's So now, we'll instead of getting the name polystyrene, you get the chat. So again, keep keep in mind, I don't know if you ever have any pictures of port. It did. So anything that ever goes on port, it's all calibrating. Run a cell test before you run your scan, and then run it after if you like the bracket the result here. It's in the you don't know where it's at when you're packing the right post. Oh, you didn't catch any bites. You're right. It's all calibrated. How do you know it's running right? You did the cell test. So that's your good one. In those lab cases, that's really right there. Now the other thing it will do when you print a report out, it will show you that your self test passed, and so it also will show you on the printout the device is working. But now if you just want to run on the diagram, do it the way you did it the first time. So hit X to get out of that. Now if you want to, yeah, you can go do the self test now from the FTA coming up. Okay, how do you? Beautiful. We like it. We like it. So, I want to ask you a question now. This relates to the ramen. Remember, we talked about color in the ramen. Should the ramen see this? What color is the container? Clear. So I can see the liquid, but the liquid is dark and it's colored. What about that? <coughs> <coughs> so what I want you to do is I want you to run under with the ramen side, I want you to run both of these and see if one works, one doesn't, if one's faster or slower. So we should have the other oh it's right there. It's in this side. So side of those. And a lot of times the only thing you have to do is on these, you see the liquid level is really low. Make sure you get it into that liquid level. So on this you could actually hold and hold it like that to make sure it's in the liquid, or you could try setting it on yes. something to get yes. it the right distance. Yes, this is on This, yeah. You only have this only has to disappear when it's going on the side. So you want that right on there. So go ahead and press your scan key. And so now, so here's your session, your power's on high, you don't have a scan delay. Since you don't have a scan delay, it's going to ask you, are you sure? Just for example, if we have a scan delay, let's say it's 30 seconds, and I start my scan, it's going to count down before the laser goes on, and I'll know the laser's on with that light. But, I'm going to come here, and I'm going to switch it, and over here it's going to say, okay, I'm going to take scan delay, I don't care about now go ahead and start it. So that tells me the laser's on. There's my signals. So the green is the movement, the yellow is the interference. So it's already done. It's just going to be done. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get the red one. It's green, so it's the device saying that I'm asking. Now, press enter. View info, view spectrum. What is acetone? Press enter. You have five tabs description, NIOSH gear, fire, and first aid. And you can scroll down or across in any one of those. You should have heard this guy getting all the work. Press enter. What was that? No, he did this. He did that. Your info screen shows you all the basic things. You tab over, you go into the NIOSH. Just so you know, if you tab down, when you're ready to run another scan on the Raman, you can do it in on the FT. You can run the Raman on this one too. All right, so you're ready to run another scan. So don't do anything yet. You've got your result. You can back out to the main screen or just press the scan key. Press this diamond button, and guess where it took you? It took me to the home page in one pass. Okay, so now you're going to scan from this double. 
Okay, go ahead and start your scan. Oh, it says scan it. You, know, you, you have to scroll over. Scan anyway, and then start your scan. Don't cross the streams, man. Oh, that's no bueno. Look at all. Oh, see the yellow bars are up? That's your interference. That's the color, the fluorescence. It's not his but the green bars, you see where it has two? If you're stuck on one, you will be there all day and never get a hit. But two or more, it's moving. It's seeing movement. And it gives it's you just a lot of interference too. Exactly. And it has a lot of interference, so it's slowing it down. But as soon as the light goes off, you're done with the scan. As soon as that light goes off, you're done with the scan. So let's see what type of a hit it got here. Boy, it sure looks like it. So yours is yellow and theirs is green. It's just a matter of how it actually got in there. Scan but again. here, let's go look at the spectrums. Remember how we do it? Enter, view spectrum, enter. Look at the spectrums. Yeah. Which is which is the, the black is your scan, and that's the, the red is the known. Remember, I said the ski slope. The ski slope was what? Interference. So does it go through the library to what most most closely matches? Yeah, the algorithm says, I'm going to search all chemicals in the library, and I'm going to match. Because what it's doing is it's matching peak by peak. It's ma matching not only one or two or three peaks, it's matching distances between peaks. So you'll get compound percentages, ones that are 97% this, no. could be this, it's just going to do It's just going to say, I see it or I don't see it. Okay. Right. Yeah, those those numbers off to the side. Of, right. that multiple, but again, that yeah, little sloping that's all is the color associated with the night yeah. 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 problem. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's ninety-seven percent this, twenty-three percent that, or it doesn't mean it's ninety-seven percent probability. It just means Gemini. So the Gemini is a combination of both of these. Okay. And the primary difference is this anvil is motorized, and then it does have a touch screen, so you pick and choose. So it'd be like if you, when you go down range, if you have both of these, you have to pick which device am I going to run. Right. On that, you know it's on this, you just have to pick. Do I want that technology or this technology? You're not scanning I had anything. a scan, I waited until the light went off. And then oh. or, or a lot of things. All right, so if you get a no match, go look at the spectrum real quick. <laughs> See here how it's got negatives? Yeah. Negatives are no bueno. Negatives are saying something interfered with it, the device didn't, isn't going to do it. So that means we've got to go rerun that scan. Okay. Okay, so this can do liquids as well, right? With yep. that little disc. Because I have that was. There's no boxes, guys. So this is just I remember those. This is 